Definitely. Okay, so let's begin the second talk uh, on deep reduction in lower bound near uh, I want to thank the organizers for uh, organizing this wonderful program here. Uh, and I want to present a survey of some recent results about depth reduction and lower bounds for arithmetic circuits. So this talk will be self-contained. And just in case I, uh, I have some terminology which I don't introduce, please stop me and ask. Uh, in the last workshop, Klim already talked about depth reduction, so I thought I will uh, give an overview of the depth reduction results, but focus more on lower bounds and a specific lower bound. So I'll try to give you the full proof of that lower bound. So let's begin. So I'll tell you what the lower bound, specific lower bound result is that I will talk about today. I'll then give the background and motivation. This will be the survey part of the talk. Then I will try to give you a full proof of this lower bound, and, uh, and that's it. So, so here's the statement that I want to talk about today. So I'll present to you an explicit family of polynomials of degree d on d cube variables, such that if you write it as a sum of product of homogeneous polynomials, the size of the expression the, of, of this expression of as a sum of product of polynomials must be at least 2 to the square root d log d. So roughly exponential in square root d. And you'll see in a moment why we worry about the log factors also. So an omega is constant? Uh, yes, there's, there will be a constant hidden here, and this constant will be about 0.5. And so you're saying uh, the total number of monomials in, in the total number of QIJs. So, uh, so, so I just, by the size of this expression on the right hand side, it's, it's the natural way of how you would uh, count the size of such an expression. You, uh, you just look at Take all the QIJs, look at how many monomials they have, and add this up. This is the size of my expression. And is this for any choice of basis, or? No, it will be it will be for the natural choice of basis. Uh, 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 yeah, so you will see a basis independent theorem later, but this will fix a basis. Okay. And uh, yeah, I don't know how to get rid of this basis uh, here. QIJ is some fixed set of homogeneous polynomials. No, no, arbitrary QIJs. You, so, uh, so for example, uh, this is almost true. Uh, this per, this polynomial FD could be the permanent. I want to almost philosophically show you that uh, if you write the permanent as a sum of product of sparse polynomials, then you will have to use at least two to the root D monomials. See, I'm a bit confused about QIJ is just a homogeneous polynomial. It's just a homogeneous polynomial. So I could just take QIJ to be FD because FD is supposed to be homogeneous. But uh, so FD will be dense. Uh, so uh, you have a polynomial of degree D cube on D variables, uh, D cube variables and degree D. So it will have two to the. So if you take the naive expression, FD will have more than that number of monomials. Is what he's saying. I see. So FD has some large number of monomials, and he says you cannot rewrite it in this way. And, and uh, yeah, and you have a lot more monomials in the naive expression than that, right? Yes. Uh, and oh, yeah, but this reminds me of a point that, which I think I should clarify that you can have products of sparse polynomials being very dense. So, for example. If you look at 1 plus x1 plus so on, just the linear form which adds up all the variables and raise it to the dth power, this is a polynomial of degree d in n variables which has maximum possible sparsity. It has all possible monomials. That's why because you choose bad basis. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so at least uh, what this suggests is that 
a naive monomial counting won't work. So this will be over real numbers and complex numbers. Any field of characteristic zero. So this is the, our computer science meaning of expressive. No, but that monomial, if you change the basis, can be done easily. Yes. This particular monomial, yes. So, 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 so is this result dependent upon your choice of, 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 of variables? <coughs> yes, it is. And But you will see a so that uh, basis independent result. Hold for that also? No, no, certainly not for this. So, just like I mean, it. Sorry? Yes, in fact, 0, 1. They are all 0, 1. Okay. So, uh, yeah, you'll, you'll, you'll see in a moment, I will make uh, things even more clearer. So, first of all, let me uh, say that. One more. Yeah. And for determinant, the same bound holds with what? O to the omega square root d, right? Uh, root d, yes. Uh, and the same for permanent? For the permanent, uh, uh, yes. So, the best lower bounds that we know are 2 to the root d for determinant and permanent. There's a gap, uh, a sm sm slight gap in the so lower bound. The product of matrices, there's a similar lower bound, right? Yes. yes. Yeah, I, I'm coming to that. So, so first of all, I want to mention that if you take a generic polynomial of degree d on d cube variables and want to write it like this, any mm -hmm. such expression will have size exponential in d log d. This is a s standard counting argument. So our lower bound is roughly 2 to the root d. For a generic polynomial, it's 2 to the d. So there's a lot of room for improvement here. That's what I want to point out. On the other hand, if you make any improvement to this lower bound, if you improve this to root d log square d, let's say, it will imply that vp is not equal to vnp. And I'll tell you why. Uh, and uh, okay, so uh, af after our work, Mrinal Kumar and Shubhangi Saraf they improved it uh, in a, uh, this result. Here it's almost the same result. This polynomial FD is just the iterated matrix multiplication polynomial, and it's sufficiently computable. So I'll tell you what the iterated matrix multiplication polynomial is. And this is both bad news and good news. Uh, so I'll, let me explain this. The, it shows, in, in some sense, it gives evidence that uh, the particular techniques that we used in this proof are also give lower bounds for efficiently computable polynomials. So maybe it might not work for resolving VP versus VNP because it it's working also for efficiently computable polynomials. On the other hand, it's, it, it does not mathematically prove that you cannot do it because the constant that you get here is much worse than what we know for polynomials in v, VNP. So our constant in the previous thing is like maybe 0.5. This constant is maybe 0 0.01. But this is d to the tenth variables also. So there's some yes. Uh, uh, but this is good news because it helps us uh, understand another basic question in algebraic complexity, and, and I will tell you what that is. So, uh, so yeah, any questions about the statement of the result? Just, just. So F is what? Now it's matrix. Uh, what is FD now? Yeah. So you take d matrices of size d to the 10 each. So d to the 10 by d to the 10 matrices, d of them, multiply them, and take the trace of the product. So, oh. so you get a polynomial, and that's the trace of that product. Yes, fd is the trace of this product. And again, you are going to write it in terms of uh, the yeah. entry of the matrix. Yes. yes. I see. And sum of product. No, 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 no. They are arbitrary homogeneous polynomials. No, no, uh, linearity, yeah. no linearity. In fact, here there's no restriction on the degree at all. Yeah. Yeah. Are these products all like the, the, the 
Top product, are those also homogeneous? Is it like entirely homogeneous or not? You don't need, you only need the QIs, QI gates? So, yeah, that's a good question. So we only need the QIJs to be homogeneous because once you have a product of homogeneous polynomials, uh, it's also again a homogeneous polynomials and any homogeneous summand here which is of degree more than D, you can just throw it away because it is never going to contribute anything to a degree D homogeneous polynomial. So if you allow non-homogeneous the proof won't work, is it? No, it doesn't work. Because uh, there could be lots of cancellation. Yes. And, and you'll see... In the earlier part there. Yes. And you'll see, uh, we now <coughs> know something, uh, that there's a fundamental reason there. Okay. So, so let me just very quickly uh, recall what arithmetic circuits are. Uh, you, you have seen them already. So we have addition and multiplication gates, and you build up a circuit in the natural way uh, by a sequence of these operations. <coughs> I just want to mention here that our addition gates, we will allow arbitrary constants on the edges. So, so our addition gate is, in fact, computing a linear combination of the inputs, an arbitrary linear combination of the inputs. And now the size of a circuit is just the number of edges in this graph. And we care about the depth of the circuit. This is the length of a longest path in the circuit. And we care about the depth because in some sense, low depth circuits correspond to computation which is highly parallel. So to see this, you can imagine if you are given a circuit uh, like this, and if you plug in specific values for the excise, the depth tells you after how much time will you get uh, the result at the output. So uh, low depth is high parallelism in this computation. So, th so these are the things that we care about. And uh, in this talk, uh, we will always work over uh, the complex numbers. And our gates will always have unbounded fanning, unless I tell you otherwise. What is fanning? Oh. Multiply three things, five things. In degrees. So the question was, what is fanning? It is, uh, you can multiply arbitrary number of uh, objects at one time or add an arbitrary number of objects at one time. So, so now these are sort of the two basic questions that we care about uh, in complexity in general and uh, in also in arithmetic complexity. We want to understand what can be computed efficiently and what can be computed efficiently in parallel. So let's, uh, we have more specific things, uh, more specific versions of these questions. So, uh, so, so for the first problem, one uh, specific aim is to understand whether explicit polynomials can be efficiently computed. So if you don't like explicit here, just think of it, whether the permanent has small arithmetic circuits or not. It's equivalent to that. Does the permanent have polynomial sized arithmetic circuits or not? And the second, another basic question is, can computation be efficiently parallelized? Can, uh, is it true that whatever piece of computation can be done by small circuits can also be done by small shallow circuits? Is it possible to explain that in more? Yes. So I will just uh, take an example now to explain this. So, uh, so let's look at this example of iterated matrix multiplication. So it is this polynomial, and this is the same polynomial which occurred in the kumar saraf result. You want to essentially you just want to multiply d matrices, d n by n matrices. And just to make, since the product of D matrices is a matrix, so it has a lots of polynomials, we just take the trace of the output to make it into a single polynomial. So, so just think of it as multiplying D matrices. And there's a natural way to do it. You can do it one by one, uh, multiply x1 with x2, and so on. And you get a circuit of size uh, D times n cube, or 
n to the omega if you want. But now you can ask whether this can be computed in parallel. And in this case, it's easy to see that you can exploit the associativity of matrix multiplication to do, to do this in parallel. So for example, uh, you first take x1 and x2, multiply them, but in parallel, multiply x1 and x3, x3 and x4, and so on, xd minus 1 and xd. And by this here, this operation star here, I mean, you plug in your favorite matrix multiplication algorithm. So this will actually be a sum of product of sums if you use the fast matrix multiplication. If you use the naive matrix multiplication, you'll replace this star by uh, a sum of products. But yeah, just plug in your favorite matrix multiplication algorithm here. And now notice that I have reduced my problem of multiplying D matrices into a problem of multiplying D by two matrices. And so just recurse. And doing this, uh, doing this recursively and taking the trace at the end, you get a circuit uh, which is of polynomial size, but the depth is log D, logarithmic in that degree. So now you can ask, uh, uh, well, can one do better? Can one reduce the depth also? And uh, the one other thing one can ask is whether one can do it for arbitrary circuits. And this is a, a wonderful result uh, by Valiant, Valiant, Skyam, Berkowitz, and Rakoff. Uh, very beautiful. It says that take any circuit of sizes, any any arbitrary circuit of size S, you can have another equi equivalent circuit of slightly larger size, say, say S square, and the depth is log D, which computes the same polynomial. Log D log is uh, allowing unbounded fan. I'm allowing unbounded fan in, yeah. So what uh, Klim's point was is, uh, in Valiant's original statement, it was log D log S, but there he was allowing bounded fan in, uh, gates of fan in two. But here I'm allowing unbounded fan in, so you can always expand a gate with fan in S into a sequence of get, gates of uh, depth log S. But, but it is cubic, right? The size is cubic. Uh, sorry, I yeah, it's either, it, it's certainly less than cubic. I forgot whether it's quadratic or cubic. I think for mathematicians, probably you should mention that the field size has to be large enough. No, no, this, in this, this is for arbitrary field. In fact, this is true even for Boolean circuits. No, 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 but you are not prolonged circuits. So, okay. I mean, you don't think of it as a circuit, you think of it as a polynomial, whatever. Yeah, so you can define the notion of a formal degree of a circuit, and what this D will be the formal degree of the circuit. Oh. Yeah. I mean, you Thinking of it as algebraic closure of F2, not not the Boolean circuit. That's what I'm uh, Yeah. So. So so we know this. This is I mean wonderful. We we can reduce the depth to log d, but in recent years people started asking more refined versions of this question. Suppose if I want to do it even smaller, let's say constant depth delta or maybe log log depth. And you can ask, in general, if I want to take a circuit of size S and reduce the depth to delta, how much larger must this new circuit be? Or what's the best you can do with a circuit of size of depth delta? Can I just, yes. so when you say size S and degree D, this degree refers to the degree of the polynomial computed by the circuit? Yes. Uh, uh, it refers to the degree of the polynomial computed by the circuit. There's one very nice lemma in this proof that for arithmetic circuits, we can essentially assume without loss of generality that the degree of the circuit is the same as the degree of the output polynomial. Uh, so specifically, you can take a, an arbitrary circuit which might compute very high degree polynomials in between, but you can 
convert it into another circuit which is in fact homogeneous and the size just blows up to s times d square which computes the same polynomial. So, so, the, so the circuit is homogeneous? Yeah, in fact this circuit is homogeneous as if you are computing a homogeneous polynomial. Otherwise, if, uh, if it's a general polynomial, you just add up its homogeneous components at the end. So the degree of a circuit is the maximum of the degrees of the, all the intermediate polynomials? No. Define uh, degree of a circuit. Yeah, so let me just quickly do that. So essentially you start with the inputs. This degree is zero. And any input with a label with a variable, the degree is one. And now you inductively define the degree like this. Whenever you multiply two things, you add up the degree. And whenever you add two things, you take the max of the degree of the children. And that gives you, yeah, notion of the degree of the circuit. Okay, uh, yeah, and if you do the same thing for Boolean circuits, the, the same notion of formal degree for Boolean circuits. Valence theorem is true even for Boolean circuits. So, okay. So, so now let's see a, again another example where let's say we want to do it in depth four. So, suppose we want to now do iterated matrix multiplication by a, a depth four circuit. So we are allowed sums of products of sums of products. So, but in this case, it will again be very natural. You divide your D matrices into uh, blocks of equal size. Then multiply all the blocks, uh, multiply all the matrices within a single block together in the first two levels of the circuit. And then multiply the outputs of those blocks again in the next two levels of the circuit. And the block size, it turns out uh, the optimal block size is square root d. And uh, so if you look at the size of this nice circuit, for the iterated matrix multiplication, the size is n to the square root d. This n to the square root d comes from uh, the fact that when you want to multiply square root d matrices and you are do, doing it in the trivial way as a sum of products, the, the, it has so many monomials in it. So each star is depth 2? Each, each star is again a depth 2, yes. Uh, so we have seen that matrix multiplication you can do much better. Uh, one can ask, can you one do iterated matrix multiplication much better than this? Uh, uh, isn't this iterated multiplication? What is yeah, that? this is. Uh, so the question is, can one do bet? Can one beat n to the square root d? Uh, okay, uh, and but more generally, for iterated matrix multiplication, if you are allowed circuits of depth delta, you can do it in this much size, n to the d to the 1 over 2 delta. Sorry, it should be 2 over delta. In the obvious way. In the obvious way, yes. <coughs> and uh, so, you, yeah. Previous slide again, what is it? This says square root d, that says what? This is d to the 2 over delta. This 2 should be in the numerator here. So, uh, and, and it's the obvi obvious way of doing it. So, uh, so some of the recent depth reduction results is asked about this more refined version of valence question. Uh, and, and we have some results that for arbitrary circuits, uh, you start out with an arbitrary circuit of size S. You can simulate it with a delta depth circuit of size s to the d to the 2 over delta. So in some sense, this is saying that there's nothing special about iterated matrix multiplication. You can do it for any piece of arithmetic computation, this depth reduction. But you finally reduce it to iterated matrix multiplication in some sense? 
Yeah, you can do that. Uh, you lose some log factors here, and to get rid of those log factors, uh, Tavana C went back to valence original proof and controlled the degrees much more carefully. And now one can ask, is this optimal? Is this the best we can do for depth reduction? Uh, so, okay, maybe it's a good time to take a guess. Uh, guess. Uh, what do you think? Is it optimal? Well, I have two answers for you, yes and no. Uh, so, so, <laughs> So yeah, so there is a lower bound. So okay, let me explain this lower bound. So in general, we don't know. This is still open. Uh, but so uh, suppose so I want to just uh, explain this lower bound. So in this lower bound, uh, we look at specific kinds of circuits. So it's motivated by by the kind of circuits that we know get in the existing. IT depth reduction results. So let's look at the circuit for iterated matrix multiplication. So you notice it has this property that it's a homogeneous circuit at every node you're computing a homogeneous polynomial. And moreover, you have these layers in the circuit and all the polynomials at the same layer have the same degree. So first you will uh, maybe multiply some of these monomials together, then add them up, and so on. So it turns out that in, in these depth reductions also, uh, this more general depth reductions also, the circuits that you get have this property, that these are homogeneous circuits. They are layered, and at each layer, the degrees of the polynomials are, well, not exactly the same, but almost the same, approximately the same. So, so if you have these kind of circuits, I call them regular circuits, this upper bound that you get is essentially optimal. Uh, and uh, for depth four, you can even re uh, remove the restriction of regularity, uh, just assume that the circuit is homogeneous, and for that also it's optimal, from the theorem that I told you in the beginning. So, so this is uh, the significance of that, re of that result. That Could you repeat the definition? Yeah. So this, uh, the circuit is homogeneous, and at each layer in the circuit, Look at the polynomials computed at that layer. They all have the same degree. So that's what I will call a regular circuit. With so just to make sure what's written here in the bottom left is exactly the theorem which you announced. Yes. And what is the first one? If shallow, what is shallow? Uh, like if the if the resulting Delta depth circuit is regular. So, so what is shallow? Depth delta. Depth delta, depth delta. Depth delta yes. Depth delta. It's the millimeters. So, in particular for homogeneous depth circuits, uh, depth, homogeneous depth four circuits, this is optimal. Uh, and and that might have been the end of the story, except that we know uh, that even for homogeneous depth four, we can do much better. Even for depth four, without the homogeneity restriction, we can do much better. So for example, for iterated matrix multiplication, you have a circuit of size n to the cube root of d if you allow non-homogeneity. And in fact, this construction that we know it's highly non-homogeneous. It, at intermediate levels of this circuit, it computes polynomials which are, have exponentially large degree, and then somehow all the degree 
high degree monomials cancel out, leaving you with the low degree output that you want. Yes. Going back to this lower left, didn't the theorem have some logarithm in the exponent? Yeah, but it's, it's two to the logarithms. S is 2 to the logarithms. You write S is 2 to the logarithms, and S is poly degrees. So, yeah, so in the earlier statements, I had sort of taken this S into the exponent with writing it as log S. Yeah, so this is the overview. Uh, in the rest of this talk, I'll focus on this lower bound. So, any questions about? Yeah. So, 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 how much you can homogenize a circuit, but I guess the depth goes up. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Or, or the other thing you could do is instead of computing the polynomial you want, you compute the padded version of the polynomial, and then you come up, and then you can homogenize as well. What is it? If you're willing to compute a padded polynomial, meaning you know what you're the one who initiated padded polynomials, so anyone in this room should know what that means, it should be you. If you're willing to compute the padded version of your polynomial, then you can use homogeneous circuits. Just you know, homogenize everywhere. So I don't know. So if you have a homogeneous polynomial, you just multiply by a power of linear form. That's and correct. Then and then just throw that everywhere inside your circuit to make it homogeneous. And there may be a power left over here. But the problem this lower bound doesn't work for part of Okay, so this is uh, the, the, the lower bound I'll focus on today. I'll try to give you a proof of it. So, so let me remind you what the lower bound is. We, are, we want to write a polynomial as a sum of product of polynomials of homogeneous polynomials, and I want to prove a lower bound of roughly 2 to the square root d. So, so here's, here will be our proof strategy. Uh, we'll try to identify some nice geometric property of shallow circuits, or small shallow circuits. We'll then express this geometric property in terms of the rank of some very big matrix. And then for our explicit polynomial on the left hand side, we'll show that this rank is large. So, uh, to make this somewhat more precise, let me give you a sense of these numbers. So, this matrix, this big matrix that we have, will be of size 2 to the d cube by 2 to the d cube. So, just to put this in perspective, our polynomial is of degree d. So, it has roughly uh, d, d to the d coefficients. So, 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 so roughly 2 to the d coefficients, but this matrix is going to be much larger, much larger than even the coefficient representation of the polynomial. Your, uh, adding is unbounded, right? Yeah, this, the size of this matrix is unrelated to the fan. No, I, I thought before that you said something about monomials, 2 to the d monomials or something like that. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to compare the size of this matrix with the size of f, I mean, how many coefficients does f have? Our, our polynomial is a polynomial of degree d, so it has d to the d uh, coefficients. Okay. So, just to put these numbers in perspective, and uh, it, it will turn out that for our polynomial, this rank will be basically the size of the matrix. We will lose only a polynomial factor, poly d factor in the rank. So, I will show you, but uh, this rank will be essentially the size of the matrix. Uh, okay. And now I want to point out how small this relatively small is because I want to highlight the fact that this argument is somewhat delicate. So, this matrix, the rank will uh, the small rank will be roughly almost 2 to the d cube. So, you do not see any dis, uh, difference in the ranks here and here. Uh, but notice that the constants in front of the d cube are exactly the same. 
So we look at the next coefficient. And that next coefficient will also be exactly the same, roughly d square log square d. So we'll look at the next one. And this coefficient here will be slightly larger than this coefficient here. And that will that is essentially the reason we get a 2 to the root d log d lower bound. So it's uh, so so what is important here is not the sizes of these matrices, but the ratios of the ranks of these matrices. That's the number that we care about. Not, not the absolute numbers. This ratio is the only thing that we care about. Okay. So let me uh, tell you. Yeah. This one of the flattenings that we saw um, doing the other. No, this is going to be a different kind of flattening. It's both flattening. Oh. It, it is a flattening, okay. but it's a different kind than you. Nice. Come to more of those. Sure. So, so we we want to start with geometry. So we want to identify some nice geometric property of shallow circuits. So. Uh, let's just first rewrite the definition of a shallow circuit. In our case, it was uh, a circuit is shallow if it is a sum of product of low degree polynomials. Okay, sorry, one uh, thing I should have mentioned. Uh, I will assume here for now. Assume that our homogeneous polynomials have degrees have small degrees, say squ degree square root d. So this low here will be square root d. And for now, assume that these qijs have degree square root d. So this is just another way of saying that our polynomial can be written as a sum of ti's, where the variety uh, corresponding to each ti, this is a hypersurface, but it's a union of low degree hypersurfaces. And uh, ideally, I should have been able to convert this statement into the statement about uh, the rank of a matrix. But I don't know how to do that. Uh, and uh, this, that is one of the reasons uh, I'm here. I'm hoping to find out how to do that. But, uh, but uh, I'll use the relaxation of it. So in particular, it means that each of these hypersurfaces, which is actually a union of low degree hypersurfaces, it has lots of singularities. So, so let me just explain this. Uh, so suppose you have a product of two homogeneous polynomials. So take any common zero of those two polynomials. So by V, Q1, Q2, I will just mean the common zeros of two polynomials. So any point which is a common zero of two polynomials, that is a singularity for the product. So for example, if you look at any partial derivative of the product, then and evaluate the partial derivative at a common zero A, then it vanishes, right? Because Q1 and Q2 vanish at A. And so, so uh, another way to say it geometrically would be that the variety of the partial derivatives of t contains the variety of q1, q2. And now notice that this variety has very large dimension because it's the common zeros of only two polynomials. So, so this variety also on the left has large dimension. And now we can generalize this. Uh, if you can take higher order derivatives, you, you can take kth order derivatives, and the variety of the kth order derivatives of t has dimension at least n minus t. Of when you have a product of t polynomials. And 
And now, so, uh, so, so let me just restate our geometric observation that if you have a shallow circuit, then you can write it as a sum of polynomials such that the, uh, each of those summands, they have lots of high order singularities. So, so this is the geometric property that we will try to exploit. So now, how to express this in terms of the rank of a matrix? So, so we'll use a well-known theorem by Hilbert. So it's about the dimension, uh, dimensionality of a variety. If you have, it says that if you have a variety given by an explicit set of polynomials, you can write down a linear map so that the rank of the linear map will tell you about the dimension of the variety. So specifically, you do the following. So suppose you take any variety defined by polynomials P1, P2, Ps. In our case, the, the Pi's here will be the derivatives of T. So we are interested in this variety. Instead, uh, now let's look at this linear map. So it takes as input a bunch of S polynomials. These AIs are polynomials. And by this, I mean the set of polynomials of degree at most L. It takes as input a set of L polynomials and it outputs the summation AIPI. -AI. So you can verify that this is a linear map. So if you think of these AIs as vectors, this is a linear map. And what Hilbert told us is that uh, the dimension of a variety, the information about the dimension of the variety is hidden in the rank of this linear map. In particular, if the dimension is large, then the rank of this map is small. And uh, in our, we'll have to quantify this uh, in our case. So, uh, so here's the upper bound that we have, that if we have a polynomial which is a sum of S products of polynomials, where each of the QIJs have degree T, this T will become root D eventually. So, uh, what is it? What was that Hilbert statement again? So, the quality. Uh, what did he say exactly? Uh, yeah, actually, the so the exact thing was, look at the image of this linear map, and look at the co-dimension. Think of that as a function of L. It, that will turn out to be a polynomial in L. Hilbert function, you mean? Yes. Yes. So, so the upper bound, uh, in our specific case, we can, for a sum of product of low degree polynomials, we can upper bound the rank by this much. And this is a relatively easy calculation. So I won't do it here. That you don't need that asymptotic thing as he, he was doing. You, you yes. yes. That's, okay. For these kinds of things. So what he is referring to here is that this small and large was sort of in the asymptotics. And no, that is a more general reason, but it holds in asymptotic. Whereas here the main thing is that for this specific thing you can remove the asymptotic. Well, you have to choose a large enough, but not, not too large. Yeah, polynomial in there. Yeah, but there it can be like. Yeah. I mean, that's the main thing. Uh, okay, so uh, we started five minutes late. Can we take? Okay. I mean, you don't go too much beyond. Uh, try to finish in five minutes. This is an adaptation. This lemma is an adaptation of the Hilbert. No, no, no. It's direct. It's, uh, yeah, it's a more direct computation. Yeah. So this is an inequality on the Hilbert function. Sorry? Because in our algebraic geometry, lots of results. Um, no, but he has yeah. very specific yeah. information yeah. about yeah. this. Yeah. 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 Specific from a general statement about number.
Yeah. 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 Uh, okay, so uh, basically this gives us a way of expressing this geometric property that we started with in terms of rank of the matrix. Uh, and now we have to show that for our specific polynomial FD, the rank is large. So, oh, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, okay, so this, uh, I can, oh, the proof completes because, uh, okay, so so let me tell you, this is, uh, it's, so the thing here is, we have, <laughs> we have a very large matrix, it's exponentially large. And I want to prove to you that the rank of this matrix is large. How do I do that? One way to do this might have been the following. Suppose if I could find a large sub-matrix inside it, which was upper triangular, say, uh, and zeros here, and anything here. So suppose if I could find a large combinatorial sub-matrix here, which was upper triangular, then the size of this submatrix would be a lower bound on the rank. And in the, and this is, I, I find this to be an ex really amazing fact about the determinant, that if you start with the determinant, this, the rank of this matrix is in fact the size of the smallest upper triangular matrix inside it. And it, it basically follows from one very Sorry? Uh, yeah, sorry, largest sub, uh, upper triangular submatrix inside it. And uh, it follows from a fact about <coughs> which holds only for the determinant, or for very few polynomials. Determinant is one of them. Yeah, it's by Bernstein-Stumfels that the minors of the determinant form a Grobner basis for the ideal that they generate. So because of that, we know this. And so we could do this computation for the determinant, and we got a lower bound of 2 to the root d. But we wanted to do a bit better. So what, you use that, that fact that it is a Grobner basis? Actually, it was not really needed, because we just needed a lower bound. But it kind of helped us, to, uh, because uh, we knew that we at least for the determinant, by just looking at large triangular submatrices, in principle we could compute the rank. For general ma matrices, this uh, this is hopeless, right? I mean, uh, for a general matrix, you might not find any upper triangular submatrix in it. So I'm a little confused about what is the connection between the matrix and the polynomial like the determinant. So, so this is the matrix itself. Uh, yeah, this... Uh, and then the ideal generated by the determinant you look inside yeah. the degree. So what is the matrix corresponding to the determinant? Uh, so it's this matrix. You take the derivatives of the determinant, which are minors, yeah. and then look at the yeah. ideal of those minors. It's a I'm going to do it again tomorrow morning. So. Uh, I haven't heard of this term, but you look at the ideal generated by the minors, and uh, take a slice of that ma ideal and look at its dimension. That's the matrix correspond. Yeah, actually, in algebraic combinatories, they, they have an exponential size matrix, and they show that the rank is almost two. So this kind of thing occurs there. Yeah, that's Yes. Should have been such a thing. Yes, exactly. But for other polynomials, you only have this method, you don't know if it's optimal. Like for the parents? Yes, for the permanent, we don't know it's optimal, and probably it is not. Probably the rank is larger than the. So, okay. So, I want to tell you one very nice result by Elon, though. So, 
there's another very nice method for find to certify rank of large matrices. It's the following. So, think of the columns of your matrix. Let's suppose the columns are A1 through AC. And suppose for a moment that the columns were pairwise orthogonal. Then, then the rank of this matrix would be the number of non-zero columns. But now suppose the columns are not exactly orthogonal, but almost orthogonal. And in that case, Alon gives us a way of lower bounding the ranks of such matrices. And essentially, uh, you look at M, look at B, which is M transpose M, and the rank of M will be lower bounded by trace of B whole square by trace of B square. Uh, so uh, this is, uh, in hindsight, it's a simple inequality, but amazingly powerful. So in, in fact, uh, what, is it? what is that? So uh, take the trans. Why does that inequality hold? The proof of this is two lines, but it's, as you said, it's very simple and very powerful. The proof of this is two, is just one application of Cushish. Oh, right. Yeah. No, it requires a proof of this two lines. One clever Cushish. So, yeah, so we use this uh, to prove that our matrix indeed has large rank. So, yeah. complex matrices, this is uh, yes, essentially true. Yes, you, I mean, do the natural thing, do the conjugate transpose. So, and this was also used. Yeah. This is a general fact, completely general. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's extremely powerful and very helpful here because. So, so that's it. Uh, so, okay. Uh, but one last remark. I cheated you a bit. I state, stated the theorem with QIJs being arbitrary homogeneous polynomials. And then later on, I assumed the QIJs to have low degree, degree square root D. Uh, so, so we need to uh, prove this. And the germ of this idea was given to me by Avi Vigdarsan. Uh, and independently observed by my co-authors, that essentially you do a random restriction. But uh, we couldn't get the random restriction to work. Uh, later, it turns out that if you view a random restriction as going modulo and ideal, then you can choose your ideal suitably and and then just redo the entire proof and it happens to work. So that's how you remove this degree assumption of two ideas. Yes. Yeah. So, so we, yeah, what we are doing here is removing the degree assumption and replacing it by the sparsity of the QIJs. So, so that's it. Any questions? Any uh, reason why we can't generalize to the five circuits? No, none that I know of. In fact, uh, uh, in some sense, I'm hoping that it might generalize to, let's say, homogeneous formulas or non homogeneous, uh, even non homogeneous formulas. Uh, but certainly, I mean, not, not this particular measure, maybe. Maybe we'll have to think about how to adapt it. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, but it's not clear that that 5 is a, the right question. That 4 is the right question. Just improve n to the root d to slightly bigger, and you are done. And vp is different than the Okay, it's different like who you ask. Like if you want to talk about algebraic geometries, you're not able to hear about that 4 at all. Why not? I mean, this is all algebraic geometry. Yeah, but it's 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 everything. The tools used here are. So for but our you know, linear algebra is with intuition from algebraic geometry explained it. Yeah, so can you, you need to finish the, some, uh, some symmetry? The five are 
circuits are much more symmetric when that's not. Or well, just so the so signal so lambda, so signal so lambda. So yeah, so I think the main thing is that you can't be the determinant and the square is the same. Not because of PMT. So then there's the question of field. So that's it. So that the determinant is not the main thing. is that it takes you almost to the end where it is. Yes. It, in fact, if you can improve it uh, for any poly, for any explicit polynomial, if you can improve over any field, if you can improve this. It will, in particular, imply that permanent is cannot be written as a small determinant over that field. So then that's how you like that. I didn't say anything. Yeah. Thank you. So next <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I now understand why this is a place for a lot of